Queen Victoria's Nine Children The Sons Queen Victoria had a large brood of nine children. She had incredibly high expectations for her four sons and held them up in comparison with their saintly father, Prince Albert. He was a more gentle and loving parent who doted on his offspring. He was the heart of this close-knit family, an innovation from previous royal children who lived separately from and rarely saw their parents. Victoria and Albert's children were sheltered from court life and raised at Osborne House on the Isle of Wight. There, Albert built them a Swiss cottage where they learned practical skills like cooking and carpentry, along with a robust education in history, politics, literature, and languages typical for princes. The eldest son was destined to inherit the throne of the British Empire at the height of its power, though he had to wait a long time to obtain it from his aging mother. While waiting in the wings, the three younger sons all lived active lives. Two joined the military and traveled the world, while the youngest was held back by the royal disease, hemophilia. Here are the stories of Queen Victoria's four intriguing sons. Edward, Victoria's second child and heir, was named Albert after his father and the more British-sounding Edward after his maternal grandfather, Prince Edward, Duke of Kent. The family called him Bertie. His rigorous education was a challenge to the inattentive Bertie. He struggled continuously to meet his parents' lofty expectations, but could never measure up to his saintly father or his bright older sister. Despite his academic lacking, he had an abundance of charm and sociability. As a teenager, he attended the University of Edinburgh and Oxford, where, away from his parents' imposing oversight, he enjoyed education very much. At 19, he toured North America and met President James Buchanan. Bertie's confidence and good humor made for a very successful tour. He hoped to pursue an active military career based on his own merit, but his mother vetoed this plan, and instead he was given an honorary position as colonel. While attending a military training camp in Ireland, and again back at Cambridge, 19-year-old Edward had rendezvous with an actress named Nellie Clifton. But when his royal parents learned of their son's youthful indiscretion, Prince Albert, though ill, dropped everything to visit his son and reprimand him. Albert died of typhoid fever two weeks later and Victoria never forgave her son. Hanoverian monarchs have a long tradition of parents and heirs despising each other, and Victoria and Bertie were no exception. To get Bertie under control, his mother arranged a marriage to the beautiful Princess Alexandra of Denmark. But Alexandra was deaf and spoke very little. Edward preferred the company of witty mistresses and lived a playboy lifestyle, smoking cigars and guzzling champagne. He is thought to have had some 55 different mistresses. He tried to be as discreet as possible under the disapproving eye of his prudish mother, and never acknowledged any illegitimate children, but the private life of the Prince of Wales was often fodder for society gossip and occasionally leaked to the press. His mistresses included British actress Lily Langtree, French actress Sarah Bernhardt, Lady Jenny Churchill, American mother of the famed Prime Minister Winston Churchill, Daisy Greville, Countess of Warwick and inspiration for the popular music hall song Daisy Daisy, French opera singer Hortense Schneider, wealthy humanitarian Agnes Keeser, and British socialite Alice Keeple great-grandmother to Camilla Parker Bowles, longtime mistress and now wife of Prince Charles. The prince became embroiled in scandal when he was compelled to testify in the divorce trial of his mistress, Harriet Moncrief. Princess Alexandra was aware of her husband's many dalliances, how could she not be, but seemed to have been accepting of them. The couple lived a dazzling social life, throwing glittering balls at Marlborough House and setting the trend for the lavish country house party at Sandringham House. Edward was an arbiter of fashion, popularizing tweed, homburg hats, 
Norfolk jackets, and black tie for formal occasions. He introduced the now traditional British Sunday meal of roast beef and potatoes with horseradish sauce. And all those Yorkshire puddings added a few pounds to the royal waistline, so he also popularized the tradition of men not buttoning the bottom button of their waistcoat. The queen tried to dictate to her son and daughter-in-law how they should live their life and raise their children, but the domineering queen was mostly ignored. In turn, Victoria blocked her son out of government affairs as would have been expected for an heir apparent. She disagreed with her son's liberal ideas. Despite his luxurious lifestyle, the prince was empathetic to the plight of the poor and laborers. He pushed for social reforms and was involved in public housing works. He also spoke out against racism on many occasions. But he and his mother did agree on one thing, that women should not have the vote. While Queen Victoria cloistered herself away in deep depression following her husband's death, Edward made himself popular with the people. He pioneered the royal public appearance so important to the British royal family today. In 1875, he embarked on an eight-month tour of India. His advisors remarked on Edward's habit of treating everyone the same regardless of their social standing or color. Edward's eldest son, Prince Albert Victor, was a playboy like his old man and was often embroiled in scandal. But he died at 28 during an influenza pandemic, and his younger brother George became the heir. In 1900, Edward was the victim of an attempted assassination. A 15-year-old anarchist shot at him in protest over the Second Boer War in South Africa. A year later, Queen Victoria died at 81, and Bertie became King Edward VII at the age of 59. Two days before his planned coronation, he fell ill with appendicitis. At the time, the disease was usually a death sentence, but Edward decided to undergo the cutting-edge surgery to remove the infected organ. The operation was a success, and the king popularized the life-saving procedure. He was crowned a few weeks later. King Edward improved relations with France, but didn't get along with his nephew, Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany. He particularly despised and often criticized Wilhelm's racism and anti-Semitism. He signed a treaty against Parliament's wishes, promising that if Germany invaded France, Britain would go to war, setting the stage for World War I in 1914. In 1909, Britain faced a constitutional crisis which pitted the House of Lords and the House of Commons against each other over their imbalance of power. The king gave a speech introducing measures to limit the power of the lords. In 1910, the 68-year-old king suffered several heart attacks, but refused to go to bed, saying, No, I shall not give in. I shall go on. I shall work to the end. He died later that night after a short but very successful reign of nine years. Alfred Alfred was the second son and spare to the throne. As a child, he was musical and played the violin. He joined the Royal Navy at the age of 14 and served as midshipman on the HMS Euryalus. While aboard, he made an official royal visit to the Cape Colony in South Africa, where he made a favorable impression on the colonists and the native chiefs and did a great deal of big game hunting. When Alfred was 18, King Otto of Greece abdicated and Alfred was elected to be the new king of Greece. But his parents stopped this honor as they had already decided that Alfred would succeed his father's childless brother as Duke of Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha. At 22, his mother appointed him Duke of Edinburgh, Earl of Ulster, and Earl of Kent, which entitled him to a seat in the House of Lords. The following year, he was promoted to captain in the Navy and given command of the HMS Galatee, on which he set sail around the world. He again visited Cape Town, then Australia, where he stayed for five months. While at a picnic in Sydney, Alfred was shot in the back by an Irish assassin. The bullet missed his spine by inches, but he recovered and set sail again two weeks later. He visited New Zealand, Japan, Hawaii, India, and Sri Lanka. At 30, Alfred returned home to settle down. He married Grand Duchess Maria Alexandrovna, daughter of Emperor Alexander II of Russia, who came with a staggering dowry of 100,000 pounds plus an annual allowance. 
The marriage was not a happy one. Maria was proud and haughty. She insisted that she take precedence over all of her sisters-in-law as her family was more important than theirs. The queen refused her demands. The couple traveled with Alfred's military career and spent several years in Malta. At 43, he was promoted to Admiral of the Fleet, and while nepotism may have helped him in his climb up the ranks, he was a capable commander. One officer wrote, As a commander-in-chief, he had no equal. He handled the fleet magnificently and introduced many improvements in signaling and maneuvering. When he was 49, his uncle Ernest II died and Alfred became Duke of Saxe Coburg and Gotha. He renounced his British titles and moved to Germany. He was at first unwelcome as a foreigner, but his amiability and competence eventually gained him popularity with his new people. He was very fond of music and could still be persuaded at dinner parties to play something on the violin, but one partygoer said that the noise he made was abominable. He was also a keen collector of glass and ceramic ware. His only son, Alfred, became ensnared in scandal surrounding his mistress and a possible secret marriage. The young man shot himself and died two weeks later of his injuries. His father was devastated. The following year, Alfred himself died of throat cancer. He was 55. Arthur, lucky number seven, Arthur was Victoria's favorite child. He had an interest in the military from an early age, and at 16, he enrolled at the Royal Military Academy. At 18, he was commissioned as a lieutenant in the Army. He served in South Africa and then in Canada, where he shifted from the military duties of a soldier to the glittering social life of a prince with ease. He was wined and dined by local society and met President Ulysses S. Grant and he won a medal for his bravery in the Battle of Eccles Hill, during which he fought off an Irish Republican invasion of Montreal. He was very popular in Canada and was invited to sit on the Iroquois Council and vote on tribe matters. At 24, he was created Duke of Connaught and Strathern and Earl of Sussex. At 29, he was married to Princess Louise, Margaret of Prussia. Arthur was devoted to his wife, with whom he had three children, but he also maintained a long-term liaison with Lady Leonie Leslie, American heiress and sister of his brother Edward's mistress, Ginny Churchill. I wonder if they ever double-dated. Arthur took military posts in Ireland, Egypt, and spent four years in India. His wife traveled with him. At 43, he was promoted to general. He wanted to become commander-in-chief of the British Army and equal his brother Alfred's rank, but he was denied this position. In 1910, Arthur traveled to South Africa to open the first parliament of the newly formed Union. The following year, he returned to Canada as a very popular governor general. He, his wife, and youngest daughter traveled the country extensively and visited the U.S. to meet President William Howard Taft. The family loved Canada and took to camping, fishing, hunting, and often hosted ice skating parties at Rideau Hall. Arthur played an active role in preparing Canadian troops before departing for Europe to fight in World War I. Princess Louise worked with the Red Cross during the war. In 1916, the family returned to Britain and Arthur went back to military service and royal engagements. Princess Louise died during the influenza pandemic in 1917 and was the first member of the royal family to be cremated, a new fashion at the time. In 1921, Arthur traveled to India to open the new Central Legislative Assembly. He died in 1942 at the age of 91 years, 8 months, and 15 days, the exact same age to the day as his sister, Louise. Leopold from an early age, Leopold showed great intellectual promise. Poet Alfred Lord Tennyson said that he had a very thoughtful mind and high aims. He suffered physical weakness, bruising, clumsiness, and seizures. It was soon realized that Leopold had hemophilia and epilepsy. Doctors inaccurately blamed the queen's use of chloroform during his delivery. At 19, he attended Oxford University. There he studied law, became a Freemason, and president of the chess club. In his 20s, he traveled Europe, Canada, and the United States. As his disabilities prevented him from serving in the military, he instead became a patron of humanities and sponsored the London Chess Tournament. 
He acted as his mother's unofficial secretary, often bridging the gap between the aging queen and the government of the day. He requested a regal post to Canada, but much to his disappointment, his mother refused, preferring to keep him close. She instead created him Duke of Albany. Stifled by his mother, Leopold saw marriage as a way to escape her overbearing. He was friends with Alice Liddell, for whom Lewis Carroll wrote Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. He also courted his second cousin, Princess Frederica of Hanover, but instead the pair became lifelong friends. He pursued marriages with a number of noble ladies, but enough was known about genetics at this point that none of them were interested in risking hemophilia in their children, despite his royal blood. His mother wasn't much help to Leopold's romantic aspirations either, as she objected to any lady she felt to be unworthy of a British prince. The queen finally suggested Princess Helena Frederica of Valdeck Piermont, and the couple were wed. A year later, Helena gave birth to a daughter, Alice. During her second pregnancy, Leopold's health worsened, and his doctors ordered him to a warmer climate to relieve his severe joint pain. Helena was unable to accompany her husband, but encouraged him to go. While recuperating in Caen, France, he slipped and fell, hitting his head. He died the next morning of a cerebral hemorrhage. He was 30 years old. His son, Charles Edward, was born four months later. In an upcoming episode, we'll learn about Queen Victoria's 42 grandchildren. Among their ranks were a king, an emperor, six queens, two married couples, an embarrassing number of Nazis, and many captivating characters. Today, of the approximately 28 monarchies that still survive in the world, five are occupied by descendants of Queen Victoria. A very special thank you goes to my patron, Dakota Pullis. Thank you so much for supporting my work. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting me on Patreon and help me make more fascinating videos. A link to my Patreon is in the description. Thank you for watching.